you've written about uh, binary planets. Yep. What what's and that they're surprisingly common, or they might be surprisingly common. What's the difference between a large moon and binary planets? What 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 are binary planets? What uh, what, what's interesting to say here about giant rocks flying through space mm -hmm. and, and orbiting each other? The thing that's interesting about binary objects is that they're very common in the universe. Binary stars are everywhere. In fact, the majority of stars seem to live in binary systems. Um, when we look at the outer edges of the solar system, we see binary Kuiper Belt objects all the time, asteroids basically bound to one another. Pluto Charon is kind of an example of that. It's a 10% mass ratio system. It almost is, by many definitions, a binary planet, but now it's a dwarf planet. So yeah, I, I don't know what yeah. you call that now. But the, we, know, we know that these, you know, the universe likes to make things in pairs. Yeah. Um, so you're saying our sun is an incel. <laughs> it's, it's looking, so most things are dating, they're in relationships and ours, ours is, is alone. It, it's not a complete freak of the universe to be alone, but it is, um, it's more common for sun-like stars. If you count up all the sun-like stars in the universe, about half of the sun-like star systems are in binary or trinary systems, and the other half are single. But because those binaries are two or three stars, then cumulatively, maybe like a third of all sun-like stars are single. I'm trying together. hard to not anthropomorphize the relationship the, <laughs> yeah, the stars the have with each other. Yeah, but yeah. The, triplet, the triplets. <laughs> the tri yeah, that's, yeah I've, I've, I've met those folks also. Um, <laughs> So is there something interesting to learn about the habitability, the how that affects the probability of habitable worlds when they kind of couple up like that in those different ways? Well, it depends whether we're talking about the stars or the planets. Certainly, if stars couple up, that has a big influence on the habitability. Um, of course, this is very famous from Star Wars. Tatooine in Star Wars is a binary star system, and you have Luke Skywalker looking at the sunset and seeing two stars come down. And uh, for years, we thought that was purely a product of George Lucas's incredibly creative mind. And we didn't think that planets would exist around binary star systems. It seems like too tumultuous an environment mm -hmm. for a quiescent planetary disk, circumstellar disk, to form planets from. And yet, uh, one of the astounding discoveries from Kepler was that these appear to be quite common. In fact, as far as we can tell, uh, they're just as common around binary stars as single stars. The only uh, caveat to that is that you don't get planets close into binary stars. They have like a clearance region in on the inside where planets, maybe they form there, but they, they don't last. They are dynamically unstable in that zone. But once you get out to about the distance that the Earth orbits the sun, or even a little bit closer in, you start to find planets emerging. And so that's the right distance for liquid water, it's the right distance for potentially life on those planets. And so there may very well be plenty of habitable planets around the binary stars. Binary planets is a little bit different. Um, binary planets, I don't think we have um, any serious connection of planet binarity to habitability. Certainly when we investigated it, that wasn't our drive, that this is somehow the solution to life in the universe or anything. It was really just a, like all good science questions, a curiosity-driven question. What's the dynamic? Are they legit orbiting each other as yes. they orbit the, uh, uh, the star? So the formation mechanism proposed here, because um, it is very difficult to form two protoplanets close to each other like this. They would generally merge within the disk, and so that's why you normally get single planets. But you could have something like Jupiter and Saturn form at separate distances. They could dynamically be scattered in towards one another mm -hmm. and basically not quite collide, but have a very close on encounter. Now, because uh, tidal forces increase dramatically as the distance decreases between two objects, the tides can actually dissipate the kinetic energy and bring them bound into one another. So that seemed, when we, uh, you know, when you first hear that, you think, well, that seems fairly contrived that you'd have the conditions just right to get these tides to cause a capture. But Numerical simulations have shown that about 10% of planet-planet encounters are shown to produce something like binary planets, which is a startling prediction. Um, and so that seems at odds with, naively, the exoplanet catalog, for which we know of, so far, no binary planets. Mm -hmm. And we propose one of the resolutions to this might be that the binary planets are just incredibly difficult to detect, which is also counterintuitive. 
because remember how they form is through this tidal mechanism. And so they form extremely close to each other. So the distance that Io is away from Jupiter, just a few planetary radii, they're almost touching one another. And they're just tidally locked facing each other for eternity. And so in that configuration, as it transits across the star, it kind of looks like you can't really resolve those two planets. It just looks like one planet to you that's going across the star. The temporal resolution of the data is rarely good enough to distinguish that. And so you'd see one transit, but in fact, it's two planets very close together, which are transiting at once. And so, yeah, we wrote a paper just recently where we developed um, some techniques to try and get around this problem and hopefully provide a tool where we could finally look for oh, these planets. The problem of detection of yes. these planets when they're so close. That was together. our focus, was how do you how do you get around this, this merging problem? So whether they're out there or not, uh, we don't know. We, we're planning to do a search for them, but um, it, it remains an open question. And I think just one of those fun astrophysics curiosities questions where the binary planets exist in the universe. Because then, you, you know, you have binary Earths, you could have binary Neptune, all sorts of wild stuff that would, you know, float the sci-fi imagination. I wonder what the physics on a binary planet feels like it might be trivial. I have to think about that. I wonder if there's some interesting dynamics. Like, you feel multiple, or, or would gravity feel different on different parts of the the surface of the sphere when there's another large sphere? That's interesting. Yeah, I would think that the force would be uh, fairly similar because the shape of the object would deform uh, to a flat geopotential, essentially a uniform geopotential. But it would lead to a distorted shape for the two objects. I think they'd become ellipsoids facing one another. Um, so it would be pretty wild when you, you know, people like the flat earth or spherical earth, yeah. you fly from space and you see a football shaped earth as, yeah. your, as your own planet. Finally, there's proof. And I wonder how, how difficult it would be to travel from one to the other. Cause you have to overcome the one. Well, no, it might be kind of easy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're so close to each other that helps. And I think the most critical factor would be how massive is the planet. That's sure. always, I mean, one of the challenges with escaping planets, there was a, a fun paper one of my colleagues wrote that suggested that super earth planets may be inescapable. Mm -hmm. If you're a civilization that were born on a super earth, the surface gravity is so high that the chemical potential energy of hydrogen or, or methane, whatever fuel you're using, simply um, is at odds with the with the gravity of the planet itself. Mm -hmm. And so you would, uh, you know, our current rockets, I'm not sure of the fraction, but maybe like 90% of the rocket is fuel or something by mass. These things would have to be um, like the size of the, the Giza pyramids of fuel with just a tiny tip on the top in order just to escape their planet's, planetary atmosphere. And so it has been argued that if you live on a super earth, you may be you may be forced to live there forever. There may be no escape unless you invent a space elevator or something, but then... How do you even build the infrastructure in space to to do something like that in the absence of a successful rocket program? Um, and so the more and more we we look at our Earth and think about the sorts of problems we're facing, the more you see things about the Earth which make it ideally suited in so many regards. It, it's almost spooky, right? That we not only live on a planet which has the right conditions for life, for intelligent life, for sustained fossil fuel industry just happens to be in the ground. We have plenty of fossil fuels to, to get our industrial revolution going. Um, but also the chemical energy contained within those fossil fuels um, and hydrogen and other fuels is sufficient that we have the ability to escape our planetary atmosphere and planetary gravity to have a space program. And we also happen to have a celestial body, which is just within reach, the moon, mm -hmm. uh, which doesn't also necessarily have to be true. Were, were the moon not there, what effect would that have had on our aspirations of a space program in the 1960s? Would there have ever been a space race to Mars or to Venus? It's a much harder, certainly for a human program, that seems almost impossible with 1960s technology to imagine ever so, come to fruition. It's almost as if somebody constructed a set of uh, challenging obstacles before us, challenging problems to solve. They're mm -hmm. challenging, but they're doable. And there's a sequence of them. Gravity is very difficult to overcome, but we have, given the size of Earth, it's not so bad that we could still actually construct propulsion systems that can escape it. Yeah, and it's the same just... with climate change, perhaps. I mean, climate change is the next major problem facing our civilization, but we know it is technically surmountable. Yeah, you know, it's it's a it's it's it is does seem sometimes like there has been a series of challenges laid out yeah. to um, progress us towards a mature civilization that can one day perhaps expand to the stars. 
I'm a little more concerned about nuclear weapons, uh, AI, and uh, uh, natural or artificial pandemics. But yes, climate yeah, well, change. There you go. I mean, plenty, plenty of <laughs> plenty of fun milestones that. that we need to cross, uh, and we can argue yeah. about the severity of each of them. But uh, <laughs> there is no doubt that we live in a world that has serious challenges that are pushing our intellects and our will to the limit of whether we're really ready to progress to the next stage of our development.